from Plato Symposium and the speech of Diatema, I am going to talk about uh, the Symposium of Plato first. So, sorry. Plato's Symposium is a series of speeches on love given at a party in Greece. So, they dealt with the questions of what is love, what love is, uh, interpersonal relationships through love. Uh, what types of love, the purpose of love, and this symposium was actually the first major philosophical text on love in Western literature. Um, so, uh, there were multiple people present during this party, and the longest and most serious part of the night was when Socrates retells the story of Diatima or the speech of Diatima which is the ladder of love which will which will we will be tackling in a bit and there she describes the rights of love and so without further ado let's hop right on to it sorry so, in Plato's Symposium, um, Socrates retells a story between him and Diatima, a wise woman, as he describes, talking about love. So, Socrates, Socrates then proceeded on telling the qualities of love, to which he said that love is a great god and that he belongs to beautiful things. But Diatima used these exact words to him to prove that love is neither beautiful nor good. But Socrates then asked that, does that mean that love is ugly? Diotima scolded him and asking him if if something is, is not beautiful, is it ugly? If something is not wise, is it ignorant? Diotima proceeds then on to say that um, there is something in between wisdom and ignorance and the answer is judging things correctly without being able to give a reason. Thus, we cannot say that just because something is not beautiful, it is ugly, and just because something is not wise, it's ignorant. So, same with love. Uh, when you think that it is not beautiful, nor good, or good, it doesn't mean that it's ugly or bad. It could be love that it could be that love is in between and then so they proceeded to talk about love being a god to which they both replied that love is not a god and so gods are described as beautiful and happy and for something to be called happy they must they must have or possess good things good and beautiful things so if love desires these two things it means he doesn't have it Therefore, he is not a god since he does not have good and beautiful things. And then Socrates asks, What is he? What love is? What is love? So, Diotima then responded that love is a spirit. Love is a messenger. Men and gods communicate through spirit and that is love. So, Socrates then asked, who are love's parents and this is the part where Diotima's speech started so her speech started with the descriptions of love about love so love's parents were Poros and Peña he was conceived on the day Aphrodite was born and this is why he follows Aphrodite and why he loves beauty so love is actually poor he is neither mortal or immortal Poor but not completely without resources and is between of wisdom and ignorance. So, love is actually a lover of wisdom. And so, therefore, love is not loved. Instead, love is a lover. So, that, then, Diotima asks what a lover of beauty desires. And then Socrates answered that it desires to possess beautiful things. But they exchanged the word beautiful to good. Then asked what a lover of good things desire. So, if a lover of good things has his desires, he will have happiness. 
So everyone has the desire to have happiness, but but why is that some are in love and some are not? And so Dayatima answered that this is another kind of special love, a love separated from others. The next question they tackled then was, what is the purpose of love? And according to Daitima, the purpose of love is to give birth and beauty in body or in soul. She proceeds to explain that everyone is pregnant and that reproduction is what mortals have as an access to mortality. And so if love wants to have good forever, it wants immortality. The next question was about what causes love and desire in animals. Even animals seek immortality, which comes through with reproduction. Reproduction is constant. And if we're going to define the term, it would be replacing the new for the old. And so for the sake of immortality, everything shows great enthusiasm for its offsprings, which is love. Some men are pregnant in body which is why they pursue women, to gain immortality through childbirth. While others are pregnant in soul, and those who are pregnant in soul are people, poets, and craftsmen, who give birth to wisdom and virtue. And the most beautiful outcome that may came from wisdom is the art of politics, as claimed by Daiti. A man who is virtuous and becomes pregnant with wisdom will search for beauty. If he is lucky and finds someone beautiful in soul, he'll fill him with ideas about virtue. Making company with someone beautiful would then allow him to conceive and give birth to what is inside him. And the best immortality is giving birth in the soul, particularly poetry, as they are remembered forever. The Itima then ends her speech outlining what she calls the rites of love or ladder of love. First, love leads a person to love someone and beget beautiful ideas. And from those ideas, this person realizes that beauty is found in all bodies. And if he is looking for beauty, then he must see beauty in all and be a lover to all beautiful bodies. Then this person moves to thinking that the beauty of soul is greater than the beauty of body. The Yatima refers here to giving birth through soul to make young men better. And this results to lovers seeing love in activities and loss over beauties and body. And lastly, lover will give birth to many ideas and theories, finding the love of wisdom. This kind of love never passes away and is always beautiful. With that, Socrates ends the speech. This is why Socrates honors love the rights of love, and practices of them, urging others to do the same thing. Hi everyone, so today we are going to talk about one of the most powerful thinkers of his time, if not our time. Um, we all know him, he is part of the big three of the Greek philosophy, the triumvirate, uh, and he is none other than Plato. So we all know that Plato is one of the foundations of the Greek philosophy. So there will be quite a lot of ideas here. Bear with me. I have a couple of notes, but I will try to explain it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So the first idea of Plato is what we call the theory of forms. This theory can be seen in the allegory of the cave and the divided line. For today, we, go, we are going to talk about the divided line for it represents two different worlds. The first world is the world of particulars. This can be remembered with the examples of humans, chairs, trees, triangles, beautiful things, loved being, virtuous acts, and good people. This only represents the visible, perceptible, changing, earthly world of space and time. Or as Plato would like to call it, this is the representation of forms. Now, the second one, the world of forms or ideas, can be remembered for it is the invisible, changing, eternal, non-spatial, non-contemporal world of the most real things. Examples of these are 
paintings, drawings, sculptures, poems, photographs, musical performances, and the things like such. Uh, Plato would like to call this the representation of the representation of forms. Now, how I see it is the world of forms and ideas are basically the the products or the concepts that came from the world of particulars now that's just how i understand it but without the representation of forms which belong in the world of particulars there wouldn't be any representation of the representation from the world of forms or ideas it is quite uh, an idea to think of but once you ponder on it it is something that is very interesting and can be easy to understand second idea from Plato is the conceptual essentialism this is connected from the previous theory of forms because this presupposes his theory of forms for without the form of a particular thing that thing could not exist as the kind of thing it is. Um, this is only the set of properties that define concepts and ideas. That is why it's called conceptual essentialism. This a, a concept can only be essential if there is a form to be conceptualized. That's, that's basically it. Third idea from Plato is the definitional thesis. This is again connected from the previous one, the conceptual essentialism. A definitional thesis talks about how one cannot know the meaning unless one can define it. That's basically it. You just have to define something in order for you to find the meaning of that specific thing. Fourth of Plato's ideas one of many ideas is one over many principle. Now this basically talks about how one property may call many particular things. For example, a chair. We can say that a table is a chair because you can sit on it and basically the essence of a chair is something that you can sit on. That is how one over many principle works because I call a table a chair because it uh, embodies the essence of a chair which is uh, being able to sit on it so it's a, it's a very confusing idea at first but if you get a grasp on it it's it, it gets simpler fifth idea from Plato is called Plato's ethics this is basically the form of the good is the most real form um, also Plato mentioned that in order to see good one must be good sixth of plato's idea is again connected from the previous one this is called plato's epistemology which talks about how one must go beyond mere opinions of judgment of the observable world to gain knowledge of the forms including ultimately the form of good and again this connects to how to know good is to become good Seventh idea from Plato is the Socratic view of Acratia. Now, Acratia is the weakness of the will or acting against one's own better judgment is impossible. Now, because for Plato, no one does wrong knowingly, willingly, or intentionally. Any wrongdoing is done involuntarily or out of ignorance. Again, for uh, Plato's ethics, we can only know good if we are good therefore if you do something wrong you are not acting unethically you were just ignorant because you don't know good because you aren't good so for plato's eighth idea we have the psychological theory of the tripartite notion of the soul this is plato's most famous philosophical position as this theory asserts that the soul has three parts First is reason, the rational part. Second, spirit, the spirited part. And third, the appetite, the appetitive part. Now, each part of the self is associated with an ethical virtue. First, wisdom, the virtue associated with reason. Second one, courage, the virtue associated with the spirit. And third, moderation, the virtue associated with appetite. Now, he also mentions that reason must rule over the, the two through the exercise of the virtue of wisdom. 
in order to be harmonious the soul must a aim to recollect lost knowledge through the use of reason and b seek to understand the virtue wisdom in order to be wise ninth idea from plato is that knowledge is a recollection according to him we are born with all knowledge but we lose it at birth a reminder for us is to uh, in order for us to regain knowledge we must remember that we lost it at birth we can consider our lives as a journey of regaining the knowledge that we once had and last but not the least is Plato's political position on the nature of a just society. According to him, a just state is achieved when the three parts of the state act for what they are best for. He gave us an example. First one are the rulers or the philosophical kings. They must exercise reason through virtue or wisdom. Second one are the soldiers. They must exercise their spirited part through the virtue of courage and third one are the workers which they must exercise their appetites through the virtue of moderation for uh, plato a just society will can only be achieved if these parts act accordingly to what they are best suited for to conclude this i think we can all agree that plato is a great thinker a powerful thinker um, his contributions, ideas, and theories are still being discussed up to this day because of their contents and the value of his work. I hope we all had a good time and we learned something from Plato, uh, quite a recall from the ideas that Plato already presented us, but I'm glad to be given this opportunity to talk about Plato and his ideas. So thank you guys. Hello, good day everyone. So today we will talk about Diatima of Matinea. So first let us get to know who is Diatima. So Diatima was a teacher of Socrates, a priestess, and a philosopher of love. She appears only once in contemporary accounts in the works of Plato. And for centuries, scholars have debated her historicity. But whether or not she truly existed, the ideas attributed to her are both subtle and powerful. So, our knowledge of Diatima is so sparse that many have concluded that she was not a historical figure, but instead a literary invention. So, Diatima appears only as a character in Plato's Symposium, where Socrates refers to her as a woman of Matinea, a woman who was wise in many things, and our knowledge of her doesn't extend beyond this because the only contemporary accounts that mentioned her is Plato's doubt has been cast on her historicity. Nevertheless, there is now an increasing agreement that the balance of evidence suggests that she was indeed a real person. And as the philosopher Zoe Alwaisi has argued, fictional or not, her voice had a powerful influence on the arguments made by Socrates and therefore the history of philosophy as we know it. Even fictional philosophers can have an influence on future generations. So, okay, let us first point out the three reasons. So, first, she is answering distinctly philosophical question, what is love? In a way, Socrates finds fully acceptable in the context of tradition or traditional platonic dialogue. So, second of all, the answer attributed to Diatima is one Socrates finds fully acceptable. Diatima is a woman whose views defended by Socrates at a dinner party of men only, during a party when women tended not to be included in public philosophical discussion. So, in all of Plato's writings, there are only two women, which is Diatima in Symposium and Aspasia in Menexenus. So, they are both female characters. In both cases, their position is impersonated or articulated in absentia by Socrates. Third, Diatima's gender is noteworthy in that, for Plato, as for most philosophers throughout Western philosophy, the reason versus emotion dualism historically identified women in contrast to men with less value trait of emotion. 
So, Daithima's speech on love warrants philosophical consideration as woman's voice on an important and distinctly philosophical topic. Love in the familiar and acceptable format of a platonic dialogue. So, Daithima's historicity will never be inclusively established. So, today we'll be discussing about Daithima. On love, desire, and wisdom. So, um, what I have absorbed from the readings was love and wisdom do go together, but desire and human love are distractions in the quest for wisdom. Also, if there were an equation to sum up everything, it would be love plus wisdom equals philosophy. Um, there was an old man named Cephalus. He says that old age frees you from the burden of desire. And despite Eros being a distraction in which Plato was fully aware of this, it is necessary because it directs us to yearn further for wisdom. And actually, this is his significant contribution to Western philosophy. Um, love and lust are destructive to our minds in how we are able to think rationally, but it's also a path to grab, grasp, grasp different perceptions of life and lead us to learn more about the world to see it differently. So Eros presents a paradox. It's a whole contradiction. And um, there is there's this one question that um, um, which is very confusing on my part because it is questioned whether Daitima was a real person. Plato's works were not written in the first point of view, first person point of view rather. His views were not directly expressed and in majority of his works, uh, Socrates was the main character. Um, Plato's method of writing was done in a dialogue setting. It focused more on questions rather than the answers. And the final argument was the one of a scene as the least of importance. Um, whereas in Aristotle's works, it was always written in the first person point of view. Plato's works had various characters that we should not only consider their views, but also have a personal discourse with their thoughts as well. Now let's talk about the Tima of Mantinea. She was a wise woman who influenced historical Socrates. Um, his learnings regarding the connection of desire and wisdom. This is a huge thing because the lack of philosophical works from female philosophers. Um, Yes, there was a lack of philosophical works from female philosophers. And women in the field only exist as to how women, as to how men rather, perceive or describe them to be. And the good thing is, Plato recognized Daitima as a woman with her own voice in the ancient philosophical setting. Um, in um, Plato's work, which was oh no, oh no, oh no. And in terms of Socrates as Plato's character, Socrates here um, had a married life, had a family, he was in the military, he worked for a period of time in public office. But the question is, um, similar to uh, the question earlier regarding the Tima, is Plato Socrates identical to the historical Socrates? Um, Actually, no, 
because his views were advanced, even though it had the historical Socrates ideas. Second, it is physically impossible for Plato to remember everything historical Socrates said when he was alive word for word. Thus, Socrates in his works um, was like a mixture of a fictional and the actual Socrates. Also, the written info on Socrates difference differs from his actual ideas. Histor historical Socrates both um, he was both more and less in Plato's version of him in his works, and so is the historical Diatima, if she did exist. However, we will never know if Diatima truly existed. It will forever remain an, an enigma, a mystery. Daitima was viewed as a dominant character in, in the discourse regarding errors and wisdom. And she was given the recognition for being able to produce imposing perspectives of love's spiritual possibilities that we may stumble upon in Western literature. So let's go to the main topic, which is discussion of Daitima on reviews on love, wisdom, and love design wisdom. First is each man in party, as mentioned in Plato's Symposium, took turns in competing to glorify and worship love in the best way possible. Um, love, or Eros, rather, was like a goddess who was praised in poems and songs as per Phaedrus and Eryximachus. Eryx um, they said that she was such a marvelous goddess, but she was taken for granted. And every praisal speech uh, about love gives us more food for thought. After which, Socrates heard a philosophical discussion about Eros from Taitima, in which he seemed like an expert in explaining it. And males had dominance over the subject Eros, and Taitima being, and with Taitima being highly knowledge knowledgeable about this matter, was like a breath of fresh air. And it was Socratic Socratically approved as well. Taitima was on the same level if not more smarter than Socrates on the philosophical discussion of love. Diet and also, Diatima thinks that Eros is vigorous in nature. Eros has been viewed as the oldest, the most intricate, and the, and the one who offers the most unparalleled blessing to humankind. However, Eros gives us a spiritual awakening. It makes us embark on a spiritual journey. And this is actually really interesting to me. So going back, although Eros regularly exists in a relation between human beings, it is something heavenly, and no human would ever fully understand how divine it is. And this is called, as per the the beautiful itself. In a nutshell, her ideas in this symposium expresses how Eros is not just something earthly. It is a transcendent spiritual force. This view, of, this view of hers is regarded as Socrates' view conveyed by a wise woman and also called the true view. Um, in this symposium, Plato presents the love of wisdom as the highest form of love and philosophy as the refinement of our sexual urges that leads us to desire wisdom over sex. That is, we do not seek wisdom by first suppressing sexual desire and other distractions, but rather by refining that desire and training it on a higher purpose. Um, he is also trying to show us that philosophy is not removed from the business of everyday life. On the contrary, philosophy is the highest expression of the loves and desires that motivate us in everyday activities. If we could see things clearly, Plato is trying to suggest that we would see that our attraction to beautiful people 
or good music or exciting movies is really an attraction to beauty itself and that philosophy is the most direct route to get at what we most desire. The dialogue form in which Plato writes is more than a mere literary device. It is instead an expression of Plato's understanding of the purpose and nature of philosophy. For Plato, philosophy is a process of constant questioning, and questioning necessarily takes the form of dialogue. Aside from that, Plato also maintains that in addition to being able to identify a beautiful person or a beautiful painting, we also have a general conception of beauty itself, and we are able to identify the beauty in a person or a painting only because we have this conception of beauty in the abstract. In the other words, the beautiful things we can see are beautiful only because they participate in the more general form of beauty. This form of beauty is it is it in self invisible, eternal, and unchanging, and like the things in the visible world that can grow old and lose their beauty. On the other hand, um, Diotima describes love as the pursuit of beauty in gradual accent from the particular to the general, culminating in understanding of the form of beauty. So, um, what Diotima is trying to suggest is that what attracts us to a beautiful person, for instance, is that we perceive in that person an idea of a greater form of beauty, um, which means that we are attracted not to the person, but to the beauty in the person. There's a sentence from, um, from the reading I read, which says that if our love is keen enough, we will not be satisfied by beautiful people, but will seek out beauty in more generalized form, in minds, in the structure of a well-ordered state, and ultimately in the form of beauty itself, the most generalized form that beauty takes which is something that I agree on, but I feel like Mariella would discuss it deeper.